What is up you guys and welcome back to my channel. Before I dive into everything, if you can't tell by the level of excitement, I have a few things that I have to say first. First and foremost, as always, thank you guys from the absolute bottom of my heart for 400,000 subscribers. I still haven't come to terms with that yet. I don't even think I fully comprehend how many people that is. It's mind blowing to me that there are 400,000 of you that care about the exact same things that I do and that care about these families, care about these victims. You know, you respect and appreciate what I do and it just means so much to me and so much to these families and I hope you realize how important you are to all of this. None of this would be happening. Tips wouldn't have gone into certain cases if you guys weren't here. It's just, it's crazy and it's so important and you guys are why this channel is what it is. I also wanna say thank you so much for being so patient when it came to my Skeleton Brothers videos. Whew, I've never had anything like that happen before. It got to the point where I almost just did an entire live stream on the whole entire case. And for the Skelton Brothers, that would have been a very, very long one because I would have just ended up rambling. But I had some crazy thing happening on YouTube. I don't know if it was a glitch on my end or their end, but it took four, I, I think it was four days to upload. But you guys were very, very patient and very understanding. So I wanted to say thank you. And last, but definitely not least, I want to say a huge thank you to Audible for sponsoring today's video. As a true crime YouTuber, it's very, very difficult to find brands to work with that support the kind of content that I make and, you know, not just support the content, but they're also relevant to the content. And that's exactly what Audible is. Audible has an unmatched selection of audiobooks and Audible originals. Most of the audiobooks that I've listened to through them have directly gone towards the case and the information that I'm talking about in a video. And I'm able to share that with you guys. And you guys are then able to go and listen to the audiobook as well through Audible. Plus, in general, it's just really, really convenient, you guys. As a mother, I'm crazy running around all the time. I'm able to do some of my work through Audible while I'm on the Stairmaster at the gym or while I'm driving or while I'm getting ready in the morning. It's so convenient. You can listen anytime, anywhere from any device. And it's also really cool because if you have an audiobook that you bought and you're just not into it, you can trade it in and get a different one. And then even if you cancel, you still get to keep your library forever. I obviously tend to listen to more true crime audiobooks than anything else. I'm sure all of you guys could guess that. And right now I'm in the middle of a crazy crazy one called If You Tell by Greg Olson. You guys, this audiobook is something else. I'm just warning you now, no detail is spared, so heed my warning. It is so captivating and interesting. It's basically a story about three sisters that attempt and successfully escape from their sadistic mother. That's like the most brief explanation I can give you guys. If I go any deeper into it, you're honestly probably not gonna believe me. If you wanna try Audible for yourself so you can find out what I'm talking about, all you have to do is go to www.audible.com forward slash Danielle or text Danielle to 500, 500 and you guys will get three months of Audible for only $6.95 and not just that, you guys get to choose one audiobook and three Audible original meaning that you can get If You Tell by Greg Olson and let me know what you think. So thank you again so much to Audible for sponsoring today's video. Working with companies like this helps my channel so much more than you guys even know. So I'm always so very appreciative when they reach out to me. And again, do not forget to go check the link down below and enjoy. So now we can go ahead and just dive right on into today's video. So today we are going to be talking about the unsolved, suspicious, controversial death of 19 year old John Fiocco. There's not much information on this case out there. It was actually very frustrating because I would find bits of information or like I would find a brief mention of like a very important piece of information, but then I could never find the important fact anywhere out there. It was very, very frustrating. And it seems like everything about this case has come on basically completely quiet. A lot of people believe a lot of different things. Even authorities have absolutely no idea what happened to him. But I believe apart from that, and apart from getting this information out there to maybe someone who might have answers, this also holds a lot of lessons that can be learned. And we already know how I feel about that. So I figured this would be the perfect video to bring to you guys today. So John Fiocco was only 19 years old when he mysteriously died in Wolf Hall at the College of New Jersey, TCNJ. 
I don't know much about John himself because again, there was not a lot of information out there, but I did find a few things about him that I wanted to share with you guys. He seemed like your average nice guy. Most people that knew him described him as witty and highly intelligent. He was also very, very social and very athletic. He ran track in high school and participated in a bunch of different sports. He was really close with his family from what I've seen. And then eventually he went on to TCNJ to major in art. I believe graphic design specifically, but don't hold me to that. I only saw that mentioned about one time. He also got along really well with everyone on the track team since that was something that he was really passionate about when he was in high school, but he was also thoroughly enjoying the new freedom that he had. It's kind of difficult for the most part for many people to transition into college. You kind of are thrown into adulthood, so to speak, and having many different opportunities. And he was definitely enjoying those opportunities. On the night of March 25th, 2006, John was planning on going to a party with a few of his friends. They all pregame together in Wolf Hall, which was the dorm that he was living in, before heading out to an off-campus party. At around midnight, they all decided to come back to Wolf Hall Hall, the dorm room where they continued to drink for a couple of hours and according to those that were around him he wasn't very intoxicated he did drink before the party during the party and after but they said he was in no way belligerently drunk he was still fully capable of handling himself now this is where the information starts to get a little bit funny because i just didn't find a lot of it or it was conflicting information that i did find after 2 a.m., well, really sometime between 2 and 3 a.m., John decided to leave his dorm room on the fourth floor of Wolf Hall to go a couple of doors down to hang out with two friends there. One of these friends was a female friend, and this female friend apparently had a really, really close relationship with John. I don't know the dynamics. The only thing that I know is that she had a boyfriend, but John would still crash in her bed with her occasionally but it was frequently enough to where this wasn't abnormal for him to go and do it and no one questioned it when he got up and left the room. The last time he was seen was at about 3 a.m. when he kicked his shoes off, got in her bed and fell asleep. Now, I'm unsure if anyone stayed with him. I don't know if this female friend slept in the same bed as him or if maybe everyone that was living in the room actually left it. All I know is that no one noticed anything until the next morning at around 10 a.m. John was gone, which again, not odd. Maybe he went to get some breakfast or he went to go back to his dorm room. But the strange thing is that his shoes that he had been wearing the night before were still sitting there. And according to his roommate, he never showed up back at his room. He never got other shoes. Everything else of his remained completely where it had been left. John was just the only thing that was missing. Now, no one really panicked at first, but around 3 p.m. when he still did not show up and no one could get in contact with him, John's roommate decided to call campus police and alert them that he had no idea where John was. Now, this is campus police we're talking about, and they tend to kind of go by different rules, I guess you could say. They don't have to call local police or state police or anything like that. They usually try to deal with things on their own. But in this circumstance, they kind of wrote it off as John just wanted to be out and about somewhere. He maybe left with a girl and wanted to stay with her. Maybe he decided to go back home for a little bit. It's really not that uncommon for college students to go back home or disappear a little bit over the weekend. So they really figured this is maybe what was going on and they didn't report this to anybody else. It was a Sunday when all this was being discovered and they figured by the next day, Monday morning, John would show back up so he could go to all of his classes. But unfortunately, the next morning, John was still nowhere to be found. So at this point, it became evident something was likely not right. So 36 hours after John was last seen, you guys, 36 hours, and you guys know the time frame where it's crucial authorities get in and start looking for information. They finally, at this point, called state police. Authorities showed up to search the dorm and speak with those that had last been with John that night, and no one seemed to have any answers, and they simply weren't finding anything in their searches. It was as if John had completely vanished into thin air in the middle of the night. But on the 28th, when authorities were searching the dorm themselves, they finally made their way down to the basement, and they immediately spotted what they referred to as a voluminous amount of blood in and around the dumpster and 
and the trash compactor. Samples were taken right away to the lab to be analyzed, but upon searching the dumpster, it became very possible that this blood did in fact belong to John because in the dumpster was his wallet and his necklace. A dumpster that had been in place over the weekend when John could have possibly ended up in it had actually just been taken, I believe only a few hours before. So they were surprised they found this, but it also meant that since his body was not there, it was also a huge possibility that his body had been in the other dumpster that had been taken. So they immediately got in contact with everyone they needed to, to figure out where the dumpster had gone. Wolf Hall, along with another nearby dorm room were completely evacuated at this point so that authorities could fully search because they had a ton of blood that likely could have resulted from a fatal wound, but they had absolutely no body and no confirmation that there was a body yet in the trash. So they wanted to search the dorm rooms top to bottom for any more clues and potentially for John. Authorities began to wonder if maybe John, for one reason or another, ended up in the trash chute, which then in turn put him down into the trash compactor and dumpster, and this is what caused all the blood. They wanted to check the chute just in case John was still in there and also to see if there was any sign at all to prove he was in there to begin with. They brought in cadaver dogs to check everything out and they also brought in specialized equipment with a camera that they snaked down through the chute and there was not a single sign in the chute of John whatsoever, no blood, no nothing. So essentially whatever injuries happened to John likely either occurred after falling through the chute or he never actually fell through the chute at all. A lot of people were very on the fence about the whole idea that John had potentially fallen down at the trash chute majority of the residents didn't believe this would even be possible. They could barely fit their own regular size trash bags down the trash chute. They spoke about having to awkwardly crush pizza boxes so that they could fit down. John was a fairly average built guy. He was athletic. He was a wide man. And this trash chute was only two foot by two foot. No one believed it was possible that he could have put himself down in the trash chute because he simply just really wouldn't have fit. Upon further searching, authorities continued to find absolutely no sign at all of foul play in the dorm, but there were so many speculations flying around at this point. Rumor after rumor started. There were rumors that there was a hide and seek game and that's what caused all of this. So many people started to point the finger at the people that John had last been with. Some thought maybe something happened at the party that night and then he was followed home. There were some people that questioned if this was with some weird sort of hazing. And then some wondered if maybe the girl's bed he was in, since she had a boyfriend, if maybe that situation caused an issue. Authorities spoke to roughly over 1,000 people that lived in and around the dorm to see if they even heard anything that night, but no one gave them pretty much any clues at all from what I've seen. They have said that people offered up information, whatever that means. I don't know if it, it means information that was relevant to the case or just information in general, but authorities have not released anything substantial at all was found. When the search of the dorm it didn't seem to turn up many answers for authorities, they turned their attention to the landfill. The trash from the college had been taken to Tullytown, and I really hope I'm pronouncing that right, in Pennsylvania, so across state lines. And they had to kind of narrow down the search to where the trash was thought to be. It's very interesting, actually, because I guess there's GPS tracking when the different dump trucks drop everything off. They are supposed to report it. Maybe for instances like this, I have no idea, but it made it a little bit easier for them to kind of go through the trash that may possibly contain John's body. And on April 25th, 2006, a month after his disappearance, John's remains did in fact end up being found. From what they could visibly note right off the bat, there didn't appear to be any stab wounds, gunshot wounds, any immediate signs of foul play. So John was sent to have an autopsy and it was determined that all of his injuries were in fact consistent with someone that would go through a trash compactor. But authorities also wouldn't say if he went through the trash compactor before or after death, making me wonder if there was something else that was found that they just didn't want people to know about. So at this point, authorities released what they believed was their finalized theory, that John fell down the trash chute while drunk on the fourth floor. He hit his head or something of the sorts on the bottom and then became unconscious, potentially died from this, and then he was pushed into the dumpster and ended up in the landfill. But the problem with this is that they had absolutely no proof that this actually happened. There was no sign at all 
that John went through the trash chute. But they also had absolutely no proof that there was foul play involved, so his death was simply labeled as suspicious. The public began to run wild with theories, especially the students, because none of this made a single bit of sense. The trash chute was located in the middle of the hallway, right near other dorms. It was in its own little room, but the room was small enough to where not even two people could likely fit into it. If John had somehow drunkenly stumbled into this room, thinking it was maybe a bathroom or something else, there's no way he would have just thrown himself down the chute. There would have been a point where he would have realized, even drunk, I'm not in the right room. I'm basically in a closet. And it would have taken a lot of effort for him to open up the trash chute and get himself in there. The door was spring loaded and it opened down into the room. So he would have had to then hoist himself up on top of this door, somehow shove himself into the chute and get down to the basement where the trash compactor was and the dumpster. And to top it off, all of this in turn would have made a lot of noise. Nine times out of 10, students said that this entire room was just filled with recycling or trash. There was stuff blocking the entire room. It was difficult to even get to the chute door. So it's very possible he would have had to climb over all of that. And then the spring-loaded door was heavy and metal. It would have slammed itself closed and him trying to get through the chute to begin with or falling through it or whatever may have happened, there's no way no one would have heard that. RAs lived fairly close to the different trash rooms and he would have had to go down four stories. There were only a few other ways to get down into the basement trash room and all of those ways, students pretty much wouldn't have been able to do it. Past a certain point, the elevators even stopped going down all the way to the basement level from what I've seen. So stairs would have had been used to get all the way down to the basement. There were two fire doors that were there and that was the only way to access the trash compactor room from inside of the building and those were always locked. Employees were the only ones who had keys to those. None of the students had access, but there was also a garage outside that allowed access and that was always locked as well. The investigation seemed to be getting absolutely nowhere. So on October 18th, 2007, the case was presented to the VDOC Society. And if you're not aware of what the VDOC Society is, it's basically a society consisting of scientists, psychologists, um, former and current FBI profilers, different prosecutors, coroners, the list goes on and on. They listened to a two hour lecture on the case and asked plenty of questions and started to come up with theories. They were specifically interested in the female friend that John was sleeping with potentially that night. He was at least in her bed. They also brought up the idea that John might've potentially been a part of a drug deal gone wrong, or maybe he stumbled into a drug deal gone wrong. If you wanna be quiet and kind of sneaky in a dorm, the trash room kind of would have been a good option. Maybe he, for some reason, walked in there at the wrong point in time. They even questioned if he maybe wanted to end his life potentially, but the very final theory that they came up with revolved around the necklace that was found in the dumpster. They wondered if maybe John had thrown away the necklace, whether it be on purpose or on accident, and maybe he regretted it or realized it and wanted to go and get it. Now, the issue with this that I had at first was that nobody in their right mind would throw themselves down a trash chute or attempt to get into a locked trash compactor room for a necklace. I know personally, I won't even go on my own trash can to find something unless it's very, very important. Uh, but even then he would have had to go leaps and bounds to get this. And why would he have done it in the dead middle of the night while likely still intoxicated? No one was set really on this theory as well. And John's parents had pretty much had enough with everything. They seemed to be getting absolutely nowhere in the case and they had no idea what happened to their son. They just knew that they lost him. So in 2008, they filed a wrongful death suit against the school. And what they found for this wrongful death suit kind of changed things up a bit and did, in my opinion, make it more possible that he went down to go and get the necklace or that someone could have much easier done something to John and just put his body in the dumpster. They found out that the doors in the basement to the trash room were unlocked. The garage door to the trash room was unlocked. The actual lids to the dumpsters themselves were unlocked. Everything was unlocked. Even Wolf Hall that you had to use an ID card to get into had been open for I think at least an hour and a half that night by someone propping the door open at an entrance. 
This basically means that anyone could have entered Wolf Hall and come and done something to John or John could have wandered down into the room and ended up in the trash compactor. But still nothing seemed to get anywhere until 2011 when John's parents introduced a theory. They believed that a graduate of the school that was very familiar with the schedule, the layout, the lack of security, they believed this person might have come to the dorm and killed John for one reason or another. And as much as this seems kind of like a way out of left field theory, it wasn't because they had some damning information to back it that I am surprised has not been looked into a little bit deeper. In the lawsuit his parents brought forward, there was someone labeled under the name of John Doe. Now this John Doe is a real person and they do know his identity. They just used this to protect it. John Doe was apparently a graduate of TCNJ that had confessed to at least two people that he murdered John right after all of this happened. And those two people were so worried what he was saying was true that they went and they told authorities about it. John Doe was one of the very first people that was questioned in this entire investigation and you will not believe what authorities found and somehow, from what I've seen, no one's really acting on it. They didn't just question John Doe, they went as deep as to questioning his family. Like I'm talking mom, other relatives, and his family said that he had been struggling a lot with his mental health. He was struggling with manic depressive and bipolar disorders. And just two weeks before John Fiocco's death, John Doe was put into a psychiatric hospital. His mother even stated that her son would leave home at all hours of the night and he would be gone for these chunks of time and Nine times out of 10, he was at the TCNJ campus. And that night that John disappeared, the early morning, that's exactly where he was. And he had absolutely no alibi. So for some reason, this graduate that no longer went to TCNJ showed up on a night that one of the students ends up in a dumpster and can't have a single person create an alibi for him. It was very, very suspicious. When they spoke to more family members, as if all of that information wasn't suspicious enough in itself, they also found out that John Doe had stopped taking his medications the weekend that John Fiocco died. And his entire family described him in their words, I am literally quoting this as manic and bizarre. His own mother also even stated that the second she heard about John Fiocco's disappearance and then she found out about the blood in the basement of Wolf Hall, her very first thought was, where was my son when this happened? Even his own mother questioned if he could potentially have anything to do with this. And then two days after John's disappearance, John Doe was involuntarily committed to another psychiatric hospital. So we know at this point that this John Doe was very mentally unstable at this time. He was in the location potentially. He had no alibi and even his own mother questioned what he was doing and his involvement. But somehow, despite all of this information, it was almost completely looked over. I don't know if authorities have continued to look into this idea, but I have not seen a single thing said about it. And from what I know, it's still all just labeled a suspicious death. The wrongful death suit that John's family filed against the school ended up being settled in 2012 in favor of the family, but neither side honestly seems very content. John's family still received no answers and no closure. They claimed that it was gross negligence what the school did, that there's no reason why Wolf Hall should have been that easily accessible. I think 16 hours a day, it was fully accessible. And then when students would keep things propped open at night, the entrance doors, it basically made it a free for all. And they had, from what I've seen, no explanation as to why the entire trash room, compactor, boiler room, all of that was unlocked inside and outside the night of John's death. And since police had still not determined if it was foul play or if it was an accident, they couldn't be seen as responsible because no one really really knew what even happened to begin with. So this brings us to our theories. The hardest part about this is that there is no direct evidence pointing either way at all. I have no idea how John would have ended up going down the trash chute. I don't know why he would have gotten out of bed without his shoes on. Maybe he got up and was asked to come outside by someone. Again, I feel like I wish I knew if anyone was in the room with him at the time. There's a possibility maybe he went to go to the bathroom, but most people are weird about going to kind of public dorm bathrooms and I don't even know if that's how the setup was. Honestly, either way, I feel like he would have brought his shoes with him. Something just tells me he only meant to get up for a few 
minutes if that is what happened. I don't know about someone dragging him out of his bed like his parents have potentially claimed, uh, but I just am having a hard time believing that he put himself down there. The only other way he could have ended up in the dumpster if he did not go down the chute, which I personally do not believe he did, is if he somehow went down a couple of floors by elevator, finished it out on the stairs, managed to realize that these doors were unlocked and basically thrown himself onto the platform with all of the trash, which just seems absolutely insane and bizarre to me. And I don't understand why he would have been down there in the first place. There is a huge possibility he could have been looking for this necklace. If he had just recently thrown it away, maybe he knew that it was on this platform. It, you know, wouldn't have gone into the dumpster yet. So that's what he started with. And his weight could have easily triggered the compactor to start and maybe he just couldn't get himself out of it. But as plausible as that is, I cannot get over the fact that there is someone out there that has confessed to two people that he actually went and murdered John and no one seems to be doing more on it. And then the fact that his own family seemed to question things, my mind just is spinning on that. And to me, there's no way authorities have information that proves he wasn't there because they have themselves stated he did not have an alibi. So I'm really just confused as to why that claim isn't being taken more seriously, or at least it doesn't appear that it is. The thing that makes me probably the most upset out of all of this is that his parents and his family that love him still have absolutely no answers. It's weird to me. It's almost like authorities came and they quickly tried to figure things out, but they just kind of washed their hands of it. I don't know if anyone's even still looking into this case anymore or if it's just kind of been labeled as cold and pushed to the side. To me, it's not obvious which way it is, if it's foul play or if it's an accident, but he is still a human being regardless of which way it goes. And I feel like his family deserves an answer as to what happened to him. It's also upsetting that if this had been taken serious from the start by the campus police, that his body may have been found sooner, which may have then in turn given authorities more evidence and more answers and maybe this family a little bit more closure. We've been through this before where campus police have been alerted and they just haven't acted soon enough. You're on a college campus, crazy things are bound to happen. I'm sure there are so many calls every single day that end up being nothing, but I will still always be the kind of person that believes that something should always be done regardless. For a life is a life. And until you know for a fact that person's safe, I don't think it's okay to just sit down and hope they come back action needs to immediately be taken. While this case seems to have gone on the quiet side, there are a lot of people online that are very dedicated to finding out what exactly happened. Almost every single person that I've seen do a write-up that was from the school itself or went to the school at a later date strongly does not believe this was an accident in any way, shape, or form. Those that knew him didn't believe this would be an accident either. So let me know what you guys think down below. Do you think this is an accidental death or do you think there was foul play involved? Either way, I believe that this case should have been looked in a little bit differently and needs to continuously be looked into. Thank you guys so much for watching today's video and taking the time to listen to John's story. I honestly hope that John's family figures out what exactly happened. You know, understanding what happened to someone that you love and how they died in the exact circumstances. It's very, very difficult. Nobody wants to hear that information, but at that point, these families are able to move on with closure at least in some capacity. But John's family, they don't even know if their son was murdered or not. On that note, I'm gonna go ahead and go, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. All of the numbers will be listed down below as always. And if you haven't subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you can become a part of the Hallen fam so that we can bring them home together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.